Welcome to today's broadcast. This is Pastor Bob Andy, and we're going to talk today about a legacy of integrity. What's your life going to be like as you live for the Lord Jesus Christ, and what will you leave behind? And God wants you to leave behind not just a great ministry, not the size of your church, but integrity that you walked with God all the days of your life. You ready to go to the Word of God? Let's do it together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello, this is Pastor Bob Yandian, and welcome again to Student of the Word. We're glad you're here today. And we're going to be talking today from many passages from the book of John. We're also going to be talking about the uh, book of Proverbs because so much is mentioned in the book of Proverbs on the integrity of which we walk in. And so uh, open to John chapter 4. While you're finding there, I want to read a, a very quick testimony. And this is from Patricia. And she says here that uh, my pastor directed me to listen to you. She hasn't led me wrong in all these years. And I definitely like how you explain the word of God. Well, thank you, Patricia. Glad that you wrote that to me. And for all of you who are watching right now who've been blessed by the program, let me know. Uh, write us an email and uh, go to my uh, website. You'll find out how you can contact us and just tell us what the broadcast has meant to you. And I know that many of those who do write me, it seems like once a person becomes a partner with me, there just seems to be an attachment that was there, uh, wasn't there before. And uh, they contact me so much. And again, I'd like for you who are watching right now to consider becoming a partner with me. And a partner is somebody who just, our hearts are joined together, first of all. Our prayer life is joined together. You mentioned me in prayer and you lift up that this message will go further and further into other people's lives, but that takes finances and you want to stand with me in finances. I'm not asking any one of you to cover all the finances. I'm asking you to do your part. And as we do our part, like the widow's might, we put it all together, like the, the team of women that back Jesus and, uh, and were with him at all times. The Bible mentions them, how many there were and mentions even by name, how that they contributed financially into his ministry. If Jesus' ministry took money, well, well, who do we think we are today that, oh, he doesn't need money, just depend on God. Well, why don't you tell that to Jesus who had to have finances coming into his ministry too, because he demonstrated for us how it works for us. Be a partner with me. Whatever's in your heart, begin to just, you know, pray about that and ask God what you, he would have you to give and he'll direct you. But if he doesn't direct you, just give as you purpose in your own heart. This is scriptural. So again, go to my website, bobbyandian.com. Would love to have you as a partner to know that I have even more people standing with me for the common purpose of educating believers, getting them saved, of course, but next of all, educating them to make disciples out of them. John chapter four today. Here it says, Jesus said to them, my assignment is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Notice two things Jesus mentioned. Speaking to his disciples, he said, my assignment is this. First of all, do the will of God, and next of all, finish the work he sent me to do. God has given his will in his word, but his work comes to us through the Holy Spirit. This has to do with our calling. Again, God has given his will to us, and the message we preach, no matter how unique we are, no matter how different we are, no matter if we're male, female, no matter what calling we have, the message is the same. We want to get people saved. We want to get them filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to introduce them to the uh, part of God that heals them, prospers them. We want to talk about the love walk. We want good works to follow after them. This all comes under what we are to teach everybody, but there's also a uniqueness to our call. God made you unique. I mean, everything about your life is unique. You had no choice in your color, your nationality, when you were born, where you were born, what side of town you were born in, the socioeconomic background of your life. I mean, your eye color, your hair color, your fingerprints are unique. Everything about you is unique. And understand this, so is your calling. You might stand in the same office someone else does. I'm not the only pastor in the world but I'm the only pastor in the world that preaches like I do. And all my friends that are pastors too, they preach uniquely. In fact, if they just, I couldn't see their face, but I heard them preaching outside of recognizing their voice, I could recognize the style of ministry they have. And this is what makes us unique. And God wants us to finish our work. Notice he said, I've come to an assignment to do the will of him that sent me. And I've come to finish his work. That was his work for the ministry. Again, God's will is found in his word, but his work 
work, his calling through us is found inside of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that places us as a pastor, as an evangelist, as a giver, as a worship leader, as an encourager, as a helps minister. There are so many found in the word of God and God has a work for you to do. And if you won't do it and you won't finish it, God will find someone who will replace you. It's found throughout the word of God. Elijah did what God's will was, but he did not finish his work. Elisha did. Elijah found Elisha plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. Elisha was faithful to keep working and God chose him. But Elijah thought he was important. God replaced him with a farmer. I love that. I mean, Elijah was going on, Lord, there's no one out there that can do what I do. And God said, Elijah, there's 7,000 out there that haven't bowed their knee. Yeah, God, but they don't have the call that I do. They don't have the giftings I do. They don't work in miracles like I do. And God said, that's it. I mean, after two or three times of griping and complaining, God said, I'm gonna replace you and you'll find him plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. I love this. God always takes nobodies and makes somebodies out of them. We think we have to be somebody. Oh, he, oh look, he he got saved. He's the captain of the football team. Oh, the head cheerleader got saved. Oh, look, the mayor got saved in our church. We start going down the list of their accomplishments. And I can tell you this, God had to sweat Moses out of Moses before he could use him. Moses came from a high rank. Moses probably had done speeches in front of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people and probably thought, this is why God chose me. I'm so important. And to show God he could deliver the children of Israel, he had killed a soldier. And God said, that's not what I'm looking for. So God sent him to the backside of the wilderness for 40 years. At the end of 40 years, Moses said, oh, Lord, I can't even talk anymore. I can't even stand in front of anybody and speak. And God said, that's what I'm looking for. I will be in your mouth. I will speak for you. God had to send Saul into Arabia. And for 14 years, Galatians tells us he was there. And that's when he returned later as Paul. So again, God has to sweat the us out of us. God has to bring us down to a point where we absolutely only need him. And that's when God can take our uniqueness, our individuality, and God can begin to use it. In John chapter 17 and verse 4, Jesus said here, you remember the verse of the scripture we started with in the early part of John, John chapter four, where he says, I have a call on my life and I have to finish the work he gave me to do. Did Jesus finish the work that God gave him to do? The answer is yes. John 17, four here in his prayer before he went to the cross and he was arrested, Jesus said here, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. This is what he said at the beginning of his ministry. He said, I must finish the work that God has given me to do. God receives glory when we do his work, but God's desire for us is to complete his work. Instead of only believing God for prosperity and long life and, and other things we often do, why don't you determine that you're going to complete God's work, not just end it, not just come to a time where you say it's over. Listen, it's over when God says it's over. It's over when that anointing lifts from you, that calling lifts from you. And at that time, you might just enjoy what how many years you have left on this earth. We find that in the latter chapters of Acts where Philip the evangelist that Paul went and stayed at his house for a while. He had four daughters that prophesied, but he just went to a house where he lived. We, know, we don't know how much he did after Acts chapter eight, when he went to the city of Samaria and a great gospel revival broke out and many hundreds of thousands were saved and signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm sure many times after that, because when it came to that closing chapters of the book of Acts, when, when uh, Paul stayed there with the other disciples that followed him, I mean, it's declared there's verse of scripture. It's says Philip the evangelist. So apparently his reputation had spread to where people knew he was an evangelist. There were more meetings after chapter eight, but by the time we come to the end, he was just living in a home and his daughters had carried on the ministry. He finished the work that God gave for us to do and God gave for him to do. That's exactly what we need to do. Look at others that God has used and determine, I'm gonna finish mine. Quit trying to be somebody else. You can learn from other people, but quit trying to be them. God made you unique. Find your uniqueness. Find that slot that you fit into and quit trying to be other people and realize without you, God couldn't get the work done he intends to get done. God can replace you, but understand this, even when Elisha replaced Elijah, he picked up where Elijah left off. For 10 years, Elisha followed Elijah. And then the last thing, 
The last miracle that Elijah did was the parting of the Jordan River. They both walked across on the other side and Elijah was taken to heaven. And on the way up, his mantle came off and fell down and fell on Elisha. Elisha picked up that mantle and hit the Jordan River and it split. He picked up right where Elijah left off and completed Elijah's ministry. God's determination and greatest thing he can ask of you is not for you to accept the ministry, not to even become so blessed in the ministry and powerful in the ministry, God is looking for people who will finish their ministry. So again, instead of only believing God for prosperity, for long life, why don't you determine that God's work won't just come to an end, you're going to complete the work that God has given for you to do. God's will is for us to finish the work he gave us. Satan's desires to stop your work on this earth. This is what he did with Jesus. He offered him riches, he offered him power. He said, just give it up and follow after me. Satan's desire like it was for Jesus is to stop your work in this earth. He hates it when you get born again, but he hates it worse when you pick up your calling and start to work in it. And so once you get born again, he lost you right there. But once you start stepping into a ministry, he's gonna lose a whole lot more because through your ministry, other people will be saved. Other people will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Other people will find their calling in life and other people will begin to do the work God called for them to do. We form a team called the body of Christ. And how sad it is when you see a football team or a baseball team or something, and one of them just basically gives up, walks out there and is tired and just and, uh, and just says before everybody else, you know, that, that uh, my work is over. And so I'm just gonna exist until the, you know, this year is over, then I'm just gonna get out. Well, what happens in the ministry when we do that? How many ministers have you heard about that basically just gave up? And they came to meetings, they would get up and start to speak, but they weren't the powerhouse they used to be. Something happened and they decided it's over. You know what, it's not over till God says it's over. I mean, the fat lady hasn't sang yet in your ministry and, your, and in your calling. I'm simply saying to you today that are thinking about quitting, throwing in the towel, quitting what God's called you to do, Satan's desire is to stop your work in this earth. He'll let you be rich if you'll give up God's work. He'll allow you to walk in health if you'll just give up God's work. He offered Jesus wealth. He offered him all the kingdoms of the world if he would just stop his work for God and go to work for him. This is what Satan's desire is for you, but that's certainly not what God's desire for you is. Work is easy to begin, but it's difficult to complete and to finish. You know, I, I watch these uh, races, you know, the New York Marathon, these other marathons, you know, where the runners are there and look how many people there are. I mean, they actually have from a helicopter and uh, you know, they have to take uh, pictures down there, you know, all this, cause there's so many and there's so many thousands that are at the, at the beginning line. But you know what, by the time you get to the finish line, there's just a few crossing over, a few more crossing over and they slowly come through. But on between the starting line and the finishing line, many have just walked off. They got so tired, they just went up a hill, you know, got into a car, drove off and yeah, they started, but they didn't finish. God is not just looking for starters. He's looking for finishers. Success is not having a large ministry. Success is finishing your course. When we come back from the break, we'll talk about this as we take up again, what does it take to finish your ministry? Character, that's why we're offering the book of Proverbs. Many Christians are quick to confess all that they are, all that they have, and all they can do. They appear to overflow in knowledge of righteousness, healing, authority, and many other spiritual truths. Yet for all this spiritual knowledge, many of these same people are foolish and unlearned when it comes to the practical things of Christian life. As James said, my brethren, these things ought not be so. The book of Proverbs is a prime source of the wisdom we need for daily existence, and a close study of it is well worth our time and attention. In Proverbs, Wisdom for Today, Bobby Andian discusses what wisdom is, its benefits, how to find it, where it comes from, and how to receive it in order to help you live a life of wisdom. To order Proverbs, Wisdom for Today, visit our website at bobbyandian.com. Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines of the Christian faith are demystified. Redemption 
justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Well, I said it just before the break, just before halftime, work is easy to begin in the ministry and oftentimes in sports, whatever you do, whatever occupation you have, work is easy to begin, but it's difficult to complete and to finish. And again, there are many starters, but few finishers in the body of Christ, in those that are in ministry. I can't tell you how many ministers I started with when I first began to teach at Rayma Bible Training Center. From there, I began to pastor and how many through the years just gave up they, they thought they'd have a bigger church by that time, a bigger ministry by that time, and they simply became just discouraged, despondent, and gave up. The point of it is, again, it's not how large your ministry is, it's have you finished your course. God's not gonna say to, the, to a man here with 10,000 attended his church, and over here somebody had 50, he's not gonna say to the one with 10,000, well done, good and faithful servant, and then look at the one with 50 and say, not good, not so good, you know, you uh, servant. In other words, God is gonna say the same thing to all of us, well done, good and faithful servant, whether we had two talents, five talents, 10 talents, no matter how many we have, success is not having a large ministry, but finishing your course. This is what God said. We're gonna find out later that uh, Paul said this. He talked about coming to the end of his ministry, that I have finished the course that God gave for me. I went to Trinity Bible College, a small Bible college in Tulsa. Uh, it doesn't exist today, but the man that ran our Bible school uh, was Smith Wigglesworth's pastor from London. And he came to the United States and wanted to start a small Bible school and he was just happy to have a small Bible school. And when I went there, I had quit Oklahoma State University because the call of God was on me. And that uh, college that had so many uh, thousands of people in it, I went to a Bible school called Trinity in Tulsa and there were 30 students. In fact, it was just a converted house. My Our church was down here and about five or six blocks north of that was this little house and uh, he had rented that house and was living in it upstairs. And But the bottom floor, the living room and into the part of the dining room was where the students were. And I was one of 30. I walked in there that day and I can tell you this, when I walked into that class for the first time, I knew I was where I was supposed to be. I could have cared less if there was two students or 12 students. In fact, later I took Greek. And honestly, we started with 10, 10 students. And within just a few weeks, there were only two of us left. And I did that. I went my first year and there were two of us. I just put myself to it, learned Greek, decided I want to take a second year, went back to the same teacher. And guess what? I was the only student for nine months. She taught me at a table. And I mean, it was so easy to ask questions. It was easier for me to learn. And so I did that. But the same thing was true at Trinity. We had 30 students there. And it was interesting, by the time that that nine months was over, and it was just a one-year course, many of us were getting ready to go out into the ministry. And uh, Brother Duncombe came to me, who was the leader of the church, and said, what are you going to do? You're a great teacher of the Word. We've had you teach in here. Yes, he said, you've got, you've got a call of God, and you have an anointing and a gifting to teach. I said, thank you. He said, are you sending out your resume? I said, no, I'm not going to kick open my own doors. I'm going to take whatever comes to me and let my ministry prove itself. He said, I don't think that's wrong. You, you, got, you need to be out there knocking on doors. And every other student did. The other 29, he told him how to fill out resumes. If you feel like you're called to be a missionary, send it to these organizations, had lists of them there. And if you feel like you're called to, you know, to be uh, work in a local church, you know, here's, here's some things about churches. Here's where you can go to find out what churches need. I didn't. I was going to church. I had a Sunday school class with seventh grade boys to start with. And then eventually it worked up to college students. 
I just faithfully did that. Then from that church began another church in which my wife and I went. And you know what? I lost the number of students I had and I was working in this church. I wasn't on staff, but I was just doing whatever I could find to do. And I was given a class and we had seven to start with. And they said on sewing machines because we met in a high school and we rented the high school. And so from there, I began to start teaching uh, to uh, midweek services. And the pastor gave to me and then came to me later and said, you really got a gift to teach. Well, while I was teaching in one of those classes, I was also working for Kenneth Hagin Ministries at the time, making uh, radio broadcasts. And one and the dean of instructors came in and sat in my class one, one midweek uh, service evening. And the next day I was called in. They said, we'd like you to start teaching uh, part-time at uh, Rayma Bible Training Center. They said, uh, we'd like you to pray about it. I said, I don't need to pray about it. I've known for a long time that's where I'm supposed to be. And, fi- and I didn't ask him what the pay was. I was just thankful they paid me to do it. I mean, I would have taken it for free. I never told them that. I, maybe I'm, I'm glad I didn't, but they, are, but they gave me that. They gave me pay to do so. And from there, the ministry began. It began to grow and grow and grow. And it wasn't until about probably five years later, the Lord called me to become a pastor and opened up the door for that. But my doors have been open for, for God. And I finished that course a number of years ago when I stepped down from pastoring, but I've been doing this ever since. My ministry keeps on going, the work keeps on going. But 10 years after Trinity shut down, they had a reunion of our class there. 30 had graduated. They ran out the door. They were so excited to get into missionary work, to get into into pastoring, to get into help administrate in churches, lead praise and worship. They were so excited to get out of there and do that. 10 years later, we got back and there wasn't 30 that came back. We had seven. I even asked Brother Duncan, where's the rest of the students? And he said, most of them have quit. And I said, is this normal? He said, yes, this is normal. We have a lot of excited run out the door, but they don't finish what God's called them to do. He said, I'm thankful that you've gone on. I'm thankful I hear what God's doing in your life. It's wonderful to hear this. So I just look, and it just amazed me, but I began to understand something again. Yes, it is. It's easy to begin, but it's difficult to complete and finish. And that's why the Lord says he wants us to complete our ministry. What does it take to finish your ministry? It's not just knowledge of the word of God. Anointing is not enough. So just the presence of the Holy Spirit Gifts of the Holy Spirit are not enough. Knowledge of the word of God is not enough too. We must have character to finish our course. The tortoise won and the hare lost. The rabbit took off and the tortoise just started walking, but he's put one foot in front of another. He had character and just kept going. And the hare ran so fast. He was so far ahead. He got, he just laid down, took it easy. And you know who won the race? The turtle won the race. And so just being consistent and faithful every single day is what does it? This takes character. You know, Brother Duncan told a story about uh, one of the men in his congregation that was part of the Royal Navy and said, and when he came in to have their, their uh, guns replaced and, and fixed up and, and, the, and work done on the boat that he was on, uh, he was on destroyer. He asked Brother Duncan in London, would you like to come and see it? He says, yes. He said he got there and he said he was showing him around, but he said he saw these giant guns. He said the guns were gigantic, these things, and they would shell the shores. They would also uh, shoot at other ships. He said, these things were so large. And and his uh, and the man told him, he said, the man that was in the military, he said, Brother Duncan, he said, when they shoot these guns, he said, the recoil of the guns is so much. He said, if we didn't have gyros underneath the ship, it would capsize the ship this way or that way. And when we face these things forward and shoot it, it slows us down three knots from the recoil of the gun. He said, he looked down into the deck because they had removed it. And the deck was thick about like this with steel plates on top of steel plates. He said, why is the deck so thick? He said, these guns could rip themselves right out of the deck. And Brother Duncan got a sermon out of that. He saw the guns as the gifts of the Spirit, but he saw the deck as character, the fruit of the Spirit. If you don't have a strong deck underneath you, your gifts can rip you apart and you, they can take you to places you've never been, but your character can't stand it. You need to have character. That's why there's a development of the fruit of the Spirit, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faithfulness. All these things are there so that God can again have your ministry extended. God gave you 
you the power to complete the ministry. Philippians chapter one and verse six says this, being confident of this very thing that he also who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And this is a a verse given to us where our confidence comes from. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, Revelation chapter one and verse eight, the beginning and the end. Jesus himself is the beginning and the end, and Jesus always finishes what he begins. He wants us to do the same thing. Revelation chapter 21 and verse six, Jesus ended the book of Revelation by saying, it is done. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse two tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's not only the author and finisher of his faith, but he works in you so he can be the completer of your faith. Jesus still has work to finish on this earth. Romans chapter nine and verse 28 says, he will finish his work and cut it short in righteousness. Jesus is our example. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse three says, consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you become weary and faint in your minds. When you come to that point where you're tired and you're weary and you're ready just to give up the ministry, stop and think about Jesus, he never quit. Others quit in the word of God, Job quit, Chapter uh, seven, verse 15, he quit and then got back on board again. Moses wanted to quit. Numbers chapter 11, verses 11 through 15, Elijah wanted to quit and did. Again, I told you, Elisha took his place. This is in 1 Kings 19, 14. And even Jesus wanted to quit. Matthew 26 and verse 39, but he didn't do it when he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, again, Jesus wanted to quit. And we need to remember that, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What about Paul's legacy? Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says this, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. This is the end of Paul's life. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. There's a fight to finishing your work. You must guard the faith, which is the word of God, and then you finish your course. What will be your legacy once you leave? Acts chapter 13 tells us in verse 22 and in verse 36, and here it says, and when he, God, had removed him, Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and he will fulfill all my will. Guess what stands out about David? David went through horrible times, horrible failures, but always got up and kept on going. And in verse 36, of Acts 13, it says this, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was laid to his fathers, and he saw corruption. Was David rich? Yes. Did David live a long time on the earth? Yes. Did David have power and a large kingdom? Yes. Was David remembered for any of these? No. If you stop and think about him, you can remember him, but that's not what remembrance is said of him. Long life and prosperity are only tools to complete the work of God. Was David remembered for serving his generation? Absolutely. David completed the work that God gave him to do. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the power of the word of God. Stay with them, but make this determination. I'm not stepping out of the ministry until it's time for me to step out of the ministry. I'm not gonna quit what I'm doing until God finally releases me from this because I don't want God to have to take this and give it to somebody else. I don't believe it's important for you to work right down until the day you die. There comes a time that God wants you to enjoy the last few years of his life, but don't step down until you have that release from God that it is over. He wants you to complete your ministry. Have a good day. I'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. Join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.